Today, I wanted to take a quick moment and show you how to get the best footage possible out of the original Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera. Now, I've had a lot of people write me, they picked up this camera, and while they love using it, they just can't seem to quite get the type of footage they were expecting or that they've seen elsewhere coming out of this camera. So I'm gonna walk you through the settings that I use to get the best results possible, show you what to look for while shooting, and when we get back, we're gonna throw the footage into Resolve, do a basic quick color grade, export some proxies so that you can edit your footage in the platform you choose and hopefully get the results that you're looking for. I'm Will Von Toggen. If you're new to the channel, be sure to hit like, share, and subscribe. And with that, let's get going. Now obviously there's a lot of ways to film with this camera. You can build it up into a full giant rig or keep it very stripped down like this. A lot of people that are new to this camera, this is probably how they're gonna be shooting since they haven't quite built this up. So we're gonna talk mostly about shooting with this camera in this stripped down form. Now the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do before you go out shooting is pick up one of these. This is a variable ND filter. Now as you're gonna see when we're talking about this camera that once you're out shooting, you don't wanna mess with your settings. So a lot of the exposure control while filming is gonna come from this and not from your camera. So this is key. You're gonna to wanna to pick one of these up before you get going. Next thing you're gonna want is a basic battery adapter such as this, a micro four thirds lens. This is the Panasonic 12 to 35 millimeter with image stabilization. I highly suggest getting a lens with image stabilization, especially if you're shooting in a stripped down form like this. Beyond that, a quick memory card from Kingston. These will work with this camera. You can buy them brand new and very inexpensively. This is the 128 gigabyte card. Link in the description below. This will get you about 30 minutes on this camera shooting in RAW. And for 30 bucks a pop, you can buy as many as you need, or you can step up to the larger size memory cards. Now with all that built up, you're ready to go out and start shooting, but first I'm gonna show you the settings you should put on this camera to get the results you're after. Diving into the menu system, the first thing you're gonna do is go format your SD card. Now I highly recommend doing it in XFAT. XFAT makes it universal. You can then edit your footage and read it on either a Mac or a PC. So select XFAT, go down to yes, format my card, let it do its thing. Next thing you're gonna do is go into your settings right here and go into your menu. And I like to shoot at ISO 400. Now 800 is the native ISO for this camera. However, I feel that's only necessary if you really think you're gonna be shooting in an extreme situation. For the most part, I sometimes believe that cleaner footage is a little bit more important. And so keeping it at a lower ISO, like 400 means you're gonna get slightly cleaner footage where 800 has a little bit more noise in it due to the higher ISO. After that, your white balance. Now, again, since we're in RAW, this is something you can change later, so don't stress out about it. But I find that keeping things daylight balanced at 5600 covers you. After that, shutter angle, 180 degrees. Now, once you have these settings punched in, there's no need to change them whatsoever while you're filming, unless you're suddenly jumping into a low light setting where you might wanna bump up your ISO. But again, for the most part, you can set it and forget it and just keep things locked in as they are. Jumping back out, we're gonna look at our audio. For now, you don't really have to do anything to this. You can leave these settings as they are. Your recording format, I always recommend shooting in RAW. Now, of course, you can film in ProRes, but for the most part, I think that RAW is the best option, again, to get the most out of what we're doing with this camera. Frame rate, 23.98 frames per second. Jumping back out and going to our display settings. Now here you can change your dynamic range on the display. Again, this isn't baked into your footage. This is purely how you're gonna see it on the screen. You can switch between film and video. Video is gonna be a bit more saturated, a little bit more like it's got a color grade on it. I recommend keeping things in film mode for this while you're filming. Generally, you wanna pay attention more to the technical side of things, your exposure settings, your focus, your metering, over the actual color and saturation. Zebras, I keep my zebras at 100%. Now, what does that mean? When you're focused on something bright, such as the sky and the clouds, windows that are reflecting light, uh, if it starts to get overexposed, zebras will give you a reference of where that exposure level is at. Now, some people will keep these at 95%, some people keep them at 100%, and what that means is once you see those zebra stripes start to appear in your footage, it means that that portion of the screen is 100% exposed to its max. Now 95 would be 95%, meaning you've got a little bit more above that before it's completely blown out. I keep things at 100% because it's a better frame of reference and making sure that you're getting as much light as possible into your shadows without completely passing that threshold. So 95% is okay, I like to keep things at 100. Now jumping back out into our main menu, you wanna have your meters on, your focus peaking on. This is important for you to help keep things in focus while filming on the fly. And that's it. Those are the basic settings for this camera that I like to stick to. 400 ISO in RAW, 23.98 frames per second, 
180 degrees. Now, a lot of people while filming, they have a tendency to change the settings of their camera to help control their exposure. And this is a big no-no. You don't want to be adjusting your ISO and especially not your shutter angle or your frame rate to darken or lighten your image because that affects the actual motion of your footage. And once you dive in and start changing that, you risk making your footage look much more video-like. Do not control your exposure by changing these settings. You're gonna to wanna to control your exposure with your ND filters. So with that, let's go out and do some filming. I'll explain a little bit more about these settings and where they come to play while you're out in the field. Now, here on the screen, you'll see all of our settings. And here we have an f2.8 on the lens. With an electronically controlled lens, you can change this by toggling these arrows here. Now, in general, I like to stop my lens down at least one full stop from wide open. This tends to create a much sharper image since most lenses are at their softest when they're wide open. The Panasonic is actually pretty good when it's opened up all the way. But for this video, we'll take it down to an f3.5 to keep things as crisp as possible while still having a good depth of field. Now, as you can see from our zebra stripes, a lot of this image is overexposed and blown out. To correct this, you simply adjust the ND filter by rotating it until the exposure begins to drop to an acceptable range. As you can see here, as we turn it, the zebra stripes start to disappear. We turn it the opposite way, they start to reappear. Take them to that point where they're just barely there and then make them gone you're now within the range of exposure. Now, depending on your light and how much sky you might have in your image, you might not be able to get rid of all your zebra stripes. So you wanna keep an eye on the rest of your image to be sure you aren't underexposing something else or creating too dark of an overall image. Things like bits of sky, clouds, white trim on houses or cars, these can be tricky, but usually it is okay to have a few things just a little bit blown out. You can fix a bit of this later and resolve, so use your judgment, but try to get rid of as many zebras as possible while still keeping the rest of your image in exposure. The key is to make these exposure adjustments with your ND filter and not the camera or the lens settings. Now, if you are more advanced, keep an eye on your histogram at the bottom of the screen and be sure that your waves are in a good place. And if you're using a monitor and can access false color, check that as well. However, I'm guessing most of you who are watching aren't quite at that level yet. So for now, just going off of zebras is a good start. Quick word on NDs, you wanna be sure you're using one with IR or infrared cut. On the old Blackmagic systems, non-IR cut filters often alter the color of the blacks within your image, turning them to a sort of muddy brown. So you wanna be sure that whatever filter you're using has infrared cut on it. Also something to keep in mind, some of the cheaper variable ND filters can start to create a sort of butterfly looking vignette on your image if you stop it down too much. Now this is often why I like to keep my ISO at 400 instead of the native 800 because it helps keep you from reaching that extreme range on your filter. Moving on for focus, a neat trick on the BMP CC is to double punch the OK button on the navigation menu controls. This will punch in on your image and help you check your focus. In general, you can rely on the focus peaking lines, the little green lines you see here on my screen, but often it's also good to double check what you have. You can also access this while using the camera in record mode, so it's very useful sometimes just to quickly punch in and double check your focus. Again, you do so just by double punching that OK button. Now, there's a tendency for some folks who are out there trying to chase that sweet bokeh that they'll often opt for lenses with wider apertures over lenses with image stabilization. Now, often lenses without image stabilization are faster and yield a shallower depth of field, but unless you're shooting on a rig or a tripod, I would always recommend the use of image stabilized lenses over more iris. If your image is too shaky, no one's really gonna care about that shallow depth of field. And especially when shooting stripped down like this, image stabilization is 100% necessary. So try your best to get a lens with that feature or stick to wider lenses and tripods if you aren't able to get that image stabilized lens. This will help keep those shots stable. Of course, bigger scale productions, you're shooting with primes, high quality glass, you've got a lot of rigging. This isn't as important, but for work like this, documentary work, handheld, stripped down, that image stabilization is absolutely necessary. Now we're gonna do just a little bit more shooting, paying attention to our exposure using the variable ND filters to make adjustments. And once we have a few more shots, we're gonna take things back into Resolve and get our footage ready to edit. All right, so launching Resolve, you'll start a new project. You'll also wanna connect your memory card to your computer or hard drive if you've already backed up that footage onto a separate drive. 
And to load it into your project, you wanna click on the media icon at the bottom panel. Now up over here in the upper left, select the memory card or drop down the folders on your drive until you find the main folder containing your footage. Select this entire folder and in the box to the right of the drop down, you'll see your footage as a list. You can also toggle the thumbnails if you wish. Now you wanna select all your clips and drag them into the media pool below. If the prompt appears asking you to change your project settings, select change so that the BMPCC footage is native to the project. You'll now see that all your clips are below in the media pool. From here, you wanna move over to the edit window by selecting the edit icon here in that bottom panel. Now, obviously you can do all of your editing here in Resolve if you wish, but if you wanna edit your footage in Premiere or another program, you wanna create some proxies, which I'll show you how to do. Start off by selecting all of your clips and drag them into the timeline below. You'll see them all lined up back to back. All your footage is now in the timeline. From here, again, you can edit if you wish, but if we're just exporting, we're done with the edit window. Now go to the color grading interface by clicking on the color wheel icon again in that bottom panel. Scroll all the way over to the left, select your first clip, and you wanna enter the camera raw menu by clicking on the little camera icon right below that first clip you selected. Now here's where you unlock the abilities to modify the raw settings of your footage if need be. Click on the decode using dropdown menu and select clip. Now, as you can see, all of the options are now unlocked for adjustment. You could change everything from ISO to color balance, whatever it is that you need. Now, one setting that I do recommend changing now is the color science generation setting. If you're using LUTs designed for newer Blackmagic cameras, you'll want to change this to Gen 4. Otherwise, the LUT won't take full effect and the footage may look a little bit washed out. If your LUT was designed for the OG or the earlier Blackmagic cameras, then you don't need to worry about it. But for now, I'm gonna change it to Gen 4 because the LUT I'll be using was designed for newer Blackmagic cameras. Now this has only unlocked these options on the first clip selected above. And rather than going through every single clip and changing the decode settings, simply scroll over to the last clip, hold down the shift button and click the last clip so that all of them are selected. Go back to the decode window and press the use settings button. Now this will open up the decode menu for every single clip in your timeline, allowing you to make all these individual adjustments as you need them. Now, just a heads up that this will also change the ISO, white balance, all those settings to match the first clip that you had selected. But since we didn't change any settings while filming, this won't be an issue. However, if you did do that, say you had three shots that were done at night and you bumped up your ISO, keep in mind that it has now been changed to match that of the first clip. And if that's the case, you may wanna go back to that clip and change its settings individually. So. As you can see here, all these clips that you shot are very flat, very desaturated with very little color. So before we make our proxies for editing, we're gonna do a very quick color grade. Now, one thing to keep in mind, true colorists can often make up to 1800 bucks a day. Color grading is a highly skilled trade. However, that doesn't mean there aren't quick shortcuts that you can use to get things good enough for your purposes. Now, generally all you need to do is add a lot, maybe make a few minor adjustments here or there, depending on the shots. So that's what I'm gonna show you how to do now. Now, unless you're after something very stylized, a Rec. 709 LUT is good enough to give your footage some life. I really like the results of the 709 buttery LUT. There's a link in the description below. I think it makes great natural looking footage. So we'll use this for now, but you can definitely explore and find other LUTs that you like and use them as you wish. Now, once you have downloaded a LUT, you will need to load it into Resolve. You know, there are plenty of videos on how to do that. So for time's sake, I'm not gonna show you how to do that right now, but you will need to load these LUTs into Resolve if you want to use them. Or you can just use the 709 option natively available within Resolve. Worst case, you can also just change the color space setting to 709. But if you are gonna add a LUT, do not make that change to the color space. Keep it in black magic. Now to apply your LUT, simply go over to this graph looking window next to your footage. You'll see this little red box, it's called a node. It's already been created for the clip. To keep it simple, we're only gonna work with just this single node. What you wanna do is right click or control click the node, go down to LUTs, over to 3D LUTs, over to the LUT folder and click the LUT you wish to apply. In this case, the 709 LUT from the buttery folder. And as you can see, the LUT is instantly applied. 
Now with the nodes selected, simply copy or control C the LUT and then go through each of your clips and paste them into their individual nodes. If you aren't completely happy, you can change some of the parameters on the individual clips. For example, this shot seems a bit cold or bluish since it was filmed in the shadows. So I can warm it up a little bit by changing the color temperature to a warmer Kelvin like 6,000. And as you can see, it looks a little bit warmer, a little bit more natural. Now maybe you also want to adjust the contrast or change the ISO a little bit. Just tweak it to where you like it. And if you have a few shots that are all in the same setting and are going to need these same adjustments made to them, remember that you can make your changes on just one and then select the others and press use settings to apply the changes to all of them. When it comes to adjusting these camera metadata settings, copy and paste doesn't have any impact. You're going to want to use this use settings option to make that changes across the board. So go through all your clips, get them where you're happy. It shouldn't take much. Ideally, the LUT should have done most of the work for you. Now, another thing to look out for, if you did have a few shots with blown out highlights in the sky or elsewhere, you can do a quick fix by selecting the clip with the blown out highlight and checking the highlight recovery box. Essentially what this does is change the blown out white into a more pleasing shade of white that appears more like a color rather than overexposure. Now, if you kept your zebras at a minimum, this is likely all you need to do to patch up these little blemishes. And sometimes it's just best to apply this to all your clips just to cover your bases. All right, so you've gone through and applied the LUT to all your clips and made any minor adjustments as needed with the clips you weren't happy with. The next step is to export the proxies. For this, you wanna go over to the delivery window by pressing the rocket ship icon in that lower menu. And in the left-hand window is where your export settings are. First, you want to select the destination where you're gonna save your clips, to a drive or a folder on your computer, wherever it may be. What you wanna be sure you do though is leave the name allocation alone. We're not gonna be using that, so simply select the location for now. Check the individual clips option, otherwise you're gonna end up with one massive video clip. Then select the format. I recommend QuickTime, Apple ProRes, ProRes 422, or 422 HQ for most of your work. Now, if you're doing tons of proxies for a massive project and you're purely editing them as proxies, which will be regraded later, you may want to use a smaller setting or resolution. But for now, it's not going to be an issue. So we're going to keep things at ProRes 422 and 1080p HD. Now over here under the audio menu, you can ignore that. We're not making any changes there. Under the file menu, you want to select the use source name option. This will name each clip the same as they were when they were produced by the camera. This is very, very important if you plan to regrade your footage again after the edit. Now most of you probably won't, but it's a good habit to have if you plan on working with a colorist later on in the future. And it really makes no difference to your workflow in the meantime if they stay the same name as they were when the camera created them. So just be sure that this box is checked. Now, if you scroll down, you'll see approximately how much space you're gonna use on the drive in case you need to make things smaller. Probably not the case as these proxies will already be much, much smaller in size than the raw. Now select add to render queue and then over in the render queue, hit start render. For the most part, it will render out in real time, if not faster, since we're just doing HD. And as each clip is finished, it will appear in the folder in a viewable format. Once it's done, you can now import all your footage into Premiere or whatever program you use to edit. And you now have high quality graded footage from your BMP CC to edit and export as you need. So a question some of you might ask is why shoot raw if we're going to convert it all to ProRes anyway? Well, the answer is flexibility. The raw footage will accept the LUT much better than ProRes and adjusting things like color balance with raw creates a much more uniform result than simply adjusting tint on normal footage. Now this camera thrives in raw, it's what it was built for, and if you wanna get the most out of it, definitely shoot this way. Finally, if this is a long form project, like a feature film or something like that, eventually you might have a colorist come on once the edit is picture locked to do a full, final grade of the film and again being able to re-access the raw footage will yield a much better result and give him much more flexibility. Believe me, he will thank you in the end. Now bringing the proxies back into Resolve after an edit is a story for a different day but for now I hope this was helpful to you and hopefully makes it easier for you to get the most from this camera. Now it's capable of making amazing images and with a little practice and patience it can easily outshine some of the best cameras on today's market. So thanks so much for watching. If you have any more questions, feel free to write them in the comments below. Also, feel free to hit like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.